Oh, oh wow. Let's see, I'm looking for the title. There it is. Okay, hi, my name is Raquel. I'm order of Buyer Sell. You have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. It's one of the words they don't translate correctly. Let's see, it's been so long since I've been in here. There it is, it's that button. All right, thanks in there, Eric, for helping me out there. Got to zoom out a little bit. And there's the word that they don't translate correctly. No one buys or sells without the money. The karagma means the impress on the coin or stamp money coin. And I got the Wikipedia article going to, like, if you Google Mark of the Beast, it'll take you to where um, it'll explain and give you references to the Greek, unabridged Greek English lexicon online and so you can see for yourself and they don't translate the word mammon correctly either Jesus says you can't serve God or money you'll either love the one or hate the other or hold to the one and despise the other but the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and scoffed so anyway let's see what we have I brought all my conspiracy books with me you know it's like World Trade Center Building 7 and the coup d'etat with um, E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis, the Robert Kennedy's uh, assassination, that Saran Saran was like hypnoprogrammed to uh, create a diversion, and then the security guard behind uh, Robert was uh, had the same kind of twenty two rifle or and um, or pistol and and had a close shot right behind the ear, and they say Saran Saran never got that close to leave a powder burn, and uh, so like. Um, they're, they interview a really well-known psychiatrist called Dr. Herbert Spiegel. And he, Herbert Spiegel came out with this, um, it's called the Grade 5 Syndrome. And it, it's a test to see whether you are susceptible to hypnosis. And some people are more susceptible, and they can be indu induced into a hypnotic state in, with, like, the snap of the fingers. And... Um, so I've had, I believe I was hypnotized once, and it's kind of a crazy long story, but it had to do with the police, or the Secret Service, actually. I got busted here in Tucson for, I was being harassed at the University of Arizona for, um, oh, I was, you know, homeless, and I'd go to the library there and read, and I'd sit on the mall and talk to kids, and I had signs, you know, and I'd make, like, protest signs about money, I've got a picture of myself here, if I can find it. But so the police would always, they'd arrest me and throw me in jail. And finally, I got a public defender. No, no, actually, the, I found uh, somebody with the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, and we ended up sell, um, suing the University of Arizona police for um, false arrest. Uh, for violating my First Amendment right to be able to speak. And there we go. Let's see. There's, there's a picture of me a long time ago when uh, I was... Let's see, this was 1983. And you can see all these signs. I, like, go downtown, and, uh, and then I would uh, go to the um, mall uh, at the university... But, um, so every day I'd go downtown and make up a new sign, and it was crazy days when I was so young, and I found out, you know, these all these conspiracies, and the coup d'etat in America. The, the first one, you see, I came down here doing research about famous people who believed in eliminating money, so I was getting all these quotations, and Karl Marx believed in eliminating money, and I have, like, this thing that I call the gospel of eliminating money, and I put it up on my um, website, and, which is 666ismoney.com. Um, and I made these flyers back in, like, uh, 1985, uh, after I found a place to live. <laughs> and uh, so, like, I've been trying to spread the word about these um, mistranslations and, like, in Plato's Republic, the guardians didn't touch gold and silver, and Aristotle was against charging interest. 
He didn't believe that money should create money. And um, so income tax is due pretty soon. And they, you know, they give a really good discount to people that have capital gains and make money on interest. They don't have to pay as high of a tax rate as these people that, you know, are doing some of the blue collar work. I think they give a good discount to people that are in the transportation business because you, you can deduct your mileage. And um, so, like, if you earn fifty thousand dollars, and um, you know, you can deduct your mileage. You still get, you know, you don't have to pay that much tax. So anyway, this, uh, I mean, I've never really figured out a better way to do the tax except to not have any. I mean, like how much of it goes to the military and building bombs and we have to be the policemen of the world. I mean, these fanatic Muslims are, um, you know, they, they're like... Um, these fanatic Christians too, they, they get really um, worked up about their religion and they think they're kind of like zombies if you've ever met some of these people that I haven't seen very many lately but I don't hang out. You know, they had a guy that rants and raves at the university every once in a while, you know, but I think people are getting wise to it, you know. It's like most of the time the person who's ranting and raving isn't you know, he says he's saved, and, you know, it's ignorance is bliss, they say. And um, so, like, um, the signs of the times are, like, the Arctic ice melting and all these tornadoes. There was a horrible tornado in uh, Kansas or someplace today, Oklahoma, and that just, like, flattened this town. All these houses were just completely flattened, you know. I hope these people had hurricane insurance, so... You know, and then like California, it's really pretty scary that they're running out of water. And uh, it's like, you know, the, the Anasazi who lived in this area where we are here in Tucson, uh, and then the, the drought came and they all had to leave. And so like um, with, there was, th there's a movie that had said that there's like three tipping points that could like cause the methane to, well, the first one is, like I was saying, the Arctic ice melting, and and it's like, um, if you look at the pattern, you know, it's like the lowest, I think it is in September, and we're already at the lowest for for April or March, yeah, the March, I'm not sure if they, they don't have April's, but we're, you know, it's really low, and if it stays that way, I mean, okay, so then if the Arctic ice melts, it'll warm up the Arctic Ocean, and, and uh, it won't, the ice won't reflect the sun and then then the methane up in the arctic and that was the second tipping point is the methane and then um, if that you know the, they have peat bogs up there too with all that decaying um, vegetation uh, that used to be frozen and so that's releasing a lot of methane and methane is 20 times worse than than carbon dioxide and so that um, if, you know, it's like, I think they've even already said and this, that the Arctic is on a dead collision course and that we're going to have like six meters of water like by 2100, you know. But even before that, I saw this thing just recently on the Internet. And I, I'm not sure if I put a link to it, but they were showing the water crisis, not only in California, but... They said Spain has a bad water crisis. They didn't mention Syria, which I've told you about was one of the causes of the Syrian war there. They had millions of farmers that couldn't farm anymore, so they all went to the cities and they didn't have anything to do. So, you know, they got angry, you know, overthrow the government. You know, so that, um, they, but then they also went, they said that India has, you know, they have a huge population there and, uh, so that in 20 years they're saying that they're not going to have any fresh water. And then they went to China and they were saying that the problem that China is, well, they, they do have a water shortage and they're going to bring water from the south. They're going to build like a, a man-made river to take this, you know, just like the canals we have out in California. But so the Chinese have been polluting really bad, like some of these factories they have, 
they just don't have any kind of environmental controls and people are getting sick a lot living out there breathing the stuff you know like Beijing is like looks like it's got constant fog but it's really smog and so like um, okay you know I mean like those are the signs of the times and uh, I've been pretty much into this stuff you know about the Club of Rome and the uh, limits to growth and uh, and um, you know the optimal amount of people on this planet and um, but even then you know like there's a lot of people that are saying that you know we've been polluting too long you know what we didn't really discover this um, I mean it seems kind of instinctual though that you know if you've got a coal factory and this chimney and if you don't have a high chimney then people get sick but I don't know if they realized you know they didn't real realize you know until it was really too late the serious problem we were having with this um, carbon monox carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and global warming so you know it's like I think it's too late there's a lot of scientists that are saying that you know there's nothing we can do it's so, like when the uh, CO2 is is at um, uh, over 400 parts per million and it's never been that way for, I don't know if I have that graph with me here but um, you know it's like really shot up I've got to get one you know I can't believe I didn't I was going to bring that Al Gore's book you know the um, um, Inconvenient Truth but I didn't and uh, but you know the the amount of this um, invisible uh, odorless gas that we've been putting in the atmosphere since the industrial revolution is um, causing all this crazy weather and uh, and um, so if it gets like over just a few degrees they're going to have the oceans rise and then the third tipping point would be since there's so much CO2 it gets absorbed into the ocean and the ocean has taken a lot of the heat and uh, so that's not good either because it's going to warm up that methane under the ocean and and um, the peat bogs are, are going to like up in Alaska and other other places up there they're um, experiencing like eight degree above normal weather up there and like you know Boston and the East Coast had the polar vortex a few times so it's kind of it's shifting uh, it's climate is shifting and and once this it's a 40 year time lag or some people are saying now it's 20 years so you know there's various people there are scientists saying that like by 2030 we could have runaway climate change and uh, it'll start up in the northern hemisphere because that's where all this methane is and then it'll work its way down to the southern hemisphere so if you live down in New Zealand or Argentina you'll be able to live a little bit longer because up here even if you're like in Alaska I think it's um, you know I'm not sure I, but people are saying that you know it's gonna be um, if it gets too hot like we're right on the edge in the galaxy where it's a habitable planet and if we were just a little bit too far this way we'd have been too far away from the Sun or we'd have been too close to the Sun or or um, you know if we didn't have a moon the moon is necessary for some reason or other but I think um, like maybe well in Jupiter too they say that like having a big planet like Jupiter in the vicinity the, attracts the comets and, and things because it's got such, you know the gravity or whatever you know I don't know. There's all these contingencies necessary for life to be here, and you know, water is a pretty big miracle. How this water got here, and then also the oxygen. You know, it uh, it all started in the water. These bacteria or whatever they were, they emitted oxygen and took in sunlight and photosynthesis and all that. And so, you know, and that took so long, and that took billions of years for like three billion years for a single-celled animal to start living and and then we had worms and and sponges and fish and you know how it is and so we're here just a little tiny fraction of the time with our brains and our iPhones and 
our cars and all this other crazy stuff and our stupid jobs and our insurance companies and and illegal bad drugs you know i'm talking about you know this you know crack and meth and heroin you know that they're shipping all over here from afghanistan and uh you know, to stupefy everybody and, and keep us distracted. <laughs> it's kind of funny, like, I was looking at my cable bill, and my cable bill is, you know, really expensive for all the computer stuff. It's like $110 a month. For, I com combine, I still have a landline. And, um, and I also have a stupid phone, I call it, because it's not really a smartphone. And, but I do have one at home, a smartphone, and I'm learning how to use it. But, and that... You know, you get to be my age. You know, I just, um, so, um, like, this, I was looking through the, you know, why am I paying so much? And I didn't really, the only channel I really thought I had was Discovery Channel, plus, you know, I had Access, and I had Channel 12, and, you know, I was okay with that. And I, But I still didn't think I was getting a very good value, so I just went to Cox, you know, on the Internet, and went to see what kind of exact services I have. You know, the Wi-Fi wasn't working very good, the computer, and so that's basically the starting point. And uh, so I think I need a new wireless router. I've had this old Motorola thing for a long time, and first the Wi-Fi went out, and now the net cable is seems to not work very well sometimes. But anyway, I found out I had all these other channels, and there was, you know, I for the first time I watched the Kardashians, you know, with Bruce Jenner, and uh, and it was, you know, I mean, it's crazy that people watch this stuff. You know, they were going to Paris, and what is that, Jay-Z, or who's that guy that that's married to one of them, you know? And the, it was just, you know, it's just pretty, pretty ridiculous, you know? And uh, so that's what people watch, and, you know, I thought, like I told you last time on my show, that that what would be wonderful to, would be somebody that st just came out to tell the whole truth, you know, and, uh, you know, truth and reconciliation in order to, you know, I guess, you know, these these people, you know, like Obama, Al Gore, but, um, you know, they know, well, not all of them do, you know, I mean, like, there was an article, I think it was in Mother Jones, and I get Mother Jones on my... Uh, Facebook feed, and there was an article that showed, you know, why are there so many people in Congress that don't believe in climate change? And they pointed out that, you know, where these senators and U.S. representatives come from, you know, um, and um, that, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, that's one reason why democracy doesn't work is because you don't have an aristocracy. You have uh, mob rule, as Plato said, and uh, it's one level above tyranny. And like I told you earlier, the guardians the, of uh, Plato's Republic were not allowed to touch gold and silver uh, because it, Plato said that it's corrupting; it'll corrupt you. And like, um, so I finally put together, you know, my gospel of eliminating money. I made a little eight by. Uh, 11 um, flyer about it and uh, as told by the prophets you know these these people you know the Buddha told his dis disciples to not carry money and um, and St. Francis of Assisi didn't carry any money and um, Ezekiel here they cast their gold and silver in the streets in the you know when when it hits the fan, you know, it's like, uh, it's really the Communist Party and the Soviet Union uh, had it in their party program, but they eventually got rid of it. And Pol Pot, you know, the so-called, you know, butcher in uh, Cambodia, he uh, believed in eliminating money, and he got slandered and demonized, you know, that there, I was going to bring that book. And my dad borrowed it from me, and I never got it back. And But it was um, one of these, Noam Chomsky wrote it with this guy named Herman. I can't remember his first name, but it was um, all about, 
you know the the civil war they had in Cambodia after the United States went into Vietnam, then the United States dropped bombs on the eastern half of Cambodia, and certainly put a lot of people in their graves. And you know they talk about the killing fields, and nobody really knows how many people were killed by those bombs, but they had records of the whole villages just disappearing and because the United States was trying to bomb the supply lines from from the North K Vietnam to the South Vietnam. And so um, then they, they uh, Pol Pot got rid of money, and uh, they started getting their economy going again. And they had to evacuate the cities and uh, Phnom Penh because um, a lot of those people weren't producing anything. There were a lot of prostitutes there, and and all kinds of other bourgeoisie and everything else, you know. And so they had to get the farms going, and so they had, they had to get labor. You know, the bombs destroyed the farms, and uh, they had to rebuild canals and things like that. So after about three years, the uh, Cambodian started inviting in foreign journalists, and uh, they had one guy from the St. Louis Tribune, uh, somebody... They had three journalists there, and one of them got killed. And so the other two went back home, and um, they they wrote pretty good reports. You know, they were saying, oh, yeah, things are back pretty much back together again. But then just a few months after that, it was like on Christmas Day, the South Vietnamese invaded Cambodia and um, overthrew Pol Pot. And then they came out with this killing field stuff, you know, and... Noam Chomsky and this guy Herman uh, went in, um, did a lot of research on what really happened there. And, you know, it was a civil war, and um, they had, like I said, to evacuate the cities. To People weren't producing anything in there, and, you know, like there were prostitutes and stuff. And it's pretty bad there now, you know. It's like I got into this argument with this Cambodia scholar named, what the heck is his name, Bruce something or other, and... And uh, I told him, do you really think it's better there now than it was, um, you know, before? Like, I mean, they have a really high rate of um, of prostitution there again with children even, you know. And anyway, so it was, you know, like the whole reason we went into Vietnam and all these other places was to open up the markets. You know, it's like Karl Marx says that, you, you know, capitalism has to... If they have a surplus of goods, you know, the, if the machinery can produce more than the people in your country can consume, then you have to export it, you know, in order to continue to make money. So, you know, they wanted to open up uh, Vietnam to sell Pepsi and Coke and everything else over there. And there was an article about it, uh, a magazine, I think I told you about it. And, the, you know, the Coca-Cola, the company comes in there to places like that. And even in India, in fact, they used India as an example. And then they bribe the local government and they sink down a well and they take all this water out and uh, put a bunch of sugar in, which isn't good for you. And, you know, but a lot of places like in Mexico, you know, you want to have something to drink, uh, but, you know, you don't want to drink the water. But I'd personally rather have bottled water. So anyway, this um, they went into Vietnam and uh, opened up the markets just like we did in Japan earlier, you know, like uh, before World War I and things like that. And, um, and then, then we goaded Japan into firing the first shot. It's in World War II there to get us involved. And the World War II is all uh, about whether which form of socialism would exist. And, you know, Hitler's idea, you know, to create living space in Poland and to conquer Bolshevism, you know, didn't go over very well with the elites and with the elite people, you know, and uh, the Illuminati, if you want to call them that, or if you want to call them, uh, you know, the international bankers, really, because Hitler had a form of barter. He you know they didn't have any gold, and uh, after the war, the World War uh, One, Germany was like owing a whole bunch of money and reparations, and they had horrible inflation. And 
Hitler started getting people back to work by trading uh, raw, uh, finished products for raw materials and things like that. And so, you know, um, they um, had, you know, Hitler wrote in that book, Mein Kampf, that he wanted to um, have living space in the East and especially, you know, get rid of these Jews and uh, that he considered to be parasites. And even like today in Israel, they have those guys that wear the black coats and the hats and the beards and the long hair, the dreadlock kind of things. And they're considered parasites because they don't have to serve in the army over there and they have a lot of kids. And like I heard, like in upstate New York, they have little colonies where it's like a lot of people on food stamps and things. And, and what they do is, you know, they're studying the Talmud or they're you know, studying that all day long, you know, it's not productive. And so, you know, Hitler wanted to move those people out. It's kind of like the Muslims in Europe now. It's like, why did Britain fight World War II so that they could bring all these Muslims in there? You know, I've heard that, that these people that come into Scandinavia and these other places, they, they like to rape the women. And like after the Russians came into Germany, there, there was a lot of bad stuff like that going on and and um, John Kennedy wrote in what in his Profiles and Courage I don't know why he wrote it but he went to Germany after the war and saw women prostituting themselves for like a lipstick and I can't remember where I wrote that but I wrote it down somewhere in one of my papers so you know this German war was uh, World War Two was uh, a very, you know, you know, I don't have too much sympathy for for these religious people. You know, I mean, I believe in peace and and love. You know, that's what Jesus believed in. You know, and the problem with the Christian church today is they they don't really, you know, Jesus was a radical, and you don't hear them talking about, you know, that don't don't have the mark of the beast, which is money, and you can't serve God or money, and you know. Um, St. Francis of Assisi told his disciples to not carry any money, and so did Jesus. Jesus told his disciples to go forth with no gold or silver in your purses. And that's the same thing that these Essenes did. They were a sect that lived around the same time that Jesus did. And they had colonies, you know, communes all around the area, and it was like a brotherhood. And um, they didn't carry any money either. That's what Josephus wrote in his um, War of the Jews, I think, or was it the Antiquities? So anyway, you know, there's uh, some serious problems facing the world, and, you know, you've got to be aware of these signs of the times. And so, um, let's see what we got here. Well, you know, the rich, I don't know, i got these graphs, I'll just run through them really quick. It shows where the rich people live. The world's share of very wealthy people. So, like almost half of them live in the United States. And then way down here, you get China, but, you know, they've, and Germany, and Russia, Brazil. So, but, you know, I think a lot of these people are going to, you know, they've got like thousand acre ranches, and they have jets and, and yachts, like a lot of these Russian tycoons have these yachts, and so, like, if things get really bad, they can uh, take off and go somewhere else and and hopefully survive. You know, when things start to get really bad, they can go down to New Zealand, where it will take longer for the methane to cause global warming down there. And... Um, then, like you, like the oceans are going to rise, you know, and uh, it'll completely destroy the economy of Florida. You know, all those people are going to have to migrate somewhere else. You know, and like cement, if you make cement, that creates a lot of pollution. I don't understand why, but but they do. I think maybe they have to burn it or heat it up to make it um, purified or something. But we've got a big cement plant down here. And, you know, I don't know, I've never, I've never really looked to see if they have some kind of a chimney. And if they do, it's putting out, you know, like I said, this carbon 
monoxide, carbon dioxide is odorless, colorless. So, you know, like, I was thinking that if, um, you know, the Nazis were going to want to exterminate people, it, it, they would have been able to maybe use the exhaust from the crematoria chimney instead of using this louse disinfestant, which, according to these so-called eyewitnesses, they just dumped through the, a hole in the ceiling and then swept it out the doors or some other way, you know, but that's not a very practical, safe way to, to you know, exterminate a lot of people, you know, and the Germans weren't dumb. I mean, they had these small fumigation chambers that they used in order to fumigate clothing, and that's why they cut people's hair and um, made them take their clothes off and take a shower when they entered into these concentration camps. And so, I don't know, there's a big argument about, um, well, where did the six million go? But the six million is a vast exaggeration. I think there's like only about 2.3 million or people that really need to be accounted for. And a lot of them, you know, once the war started, started running, you know, and, and they went behind the iron into the Soviet Union. And then the Soviet Union evacuated them further. But, um, you know, the Soviet Union hasn't released any of this, the documents to prove that. Because, you know, that's kind of one of the big questions is, like I said, but they do know that a lot of these people were evacuated. And so I've been kind of studying it in this guy Butts's book, The Hoax of the 20th Century. He was like the pioneer of this Holocaust stuff. And uh, he was a professor of electrical and engineering at the University of uh, uh, Northwestern University there. And so um, it, um, he, it's real. I mean, here, I'll just give you an idea of the way this book is written. What's going on here? There you go. I mean, it's got like, you know, really nice type. And um, this guy, he's, uh, you know, like I said, a computer scientist. So he's got um, a thoroughgoing mind. And this was the chapter I was reading. It kind of explains where these people went, you know. And there's actually, I've got it here. This is more of a demographic study of where the people went with a foreword by the guy who wrote this other book here. And, uh, you know, the there's, uh, you know, like I said, the statistics are behind the, the Soviet Union. And I don't think the Soviet Union wants to admit that a lot of these people in their gulags ended up dead. You know, this they've had typhus epidemics during World War I that killed like three million civilians in the Soviet Union. And that's what this whole delousing chamber stuff was, was to kill the lice, and lice spread typhus, and that's why you see these U.S. Army newsreels of all these bodies being bulldozed into pits, but that was over at, in Belsen, you know, the Soviets never took any videos of Auschwitz, and, um, uh, but they, the, the United States Army, um, whatever they did, they, they had some, like George Stevens, he was a movie director, and he, and even Alfred Hitchcock got involved in it. And uh, if you go to my website, you can see some links to this stuff. But um, so they created these propaganda videos, you know, with the shrunken heads and the lampshades, uh, allegedly made out of human skin, the lampshades. But it's been proven this guy, Lucius Clay, who is the uh, general in, involved in Berlin, or in, in that area, he wrote in his biography that, that those weren't really human skin, it was goat skin, and, and you know, it's a reliable source, and the, the soap thing isn't, uh, that's been proven to be a lie, and, and but like I was saying, the, the reason they had this Zyklon B was to um, kill the lice and prevent epidemics, so a lot of people died in these Soviet gulags, and that's probably why the Soviet Union hasn't <coughs> released statistics about how many people <coughs> they exactly had in their gulags. You know, that guy, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, wrote a book about it, and it, not all of it 
has been translated, I, I don't think, and uh, something like 200 years or something like that. And uh, so, like, you know, there's, like, a lot of conspiracies. And here's, this This is, like, one of the first ones I have found. The first one I said, I think, was about Pol Pot, because I, you know, I couldn't believe, I found out that Pol Pot believed in eliminating money, and I was thinking, well, wow, you know, how could a guy that smart and good you know, he used to be a Buddhist um, a monk, what Pol Pot did, and so I just had an instinct that, you know, there must be some lies going on here. And I happened to find this book by Noam Chomsky, which was um, about the Indochina War and, uh, and, and Cambodia. And uh, he's written a few more little essays on it. I didn't get to see him when he was here, and I would like to have asked him a question about that, but... So then this was like maybe the second book I found, and I don't know how I picked this up, I just can't remember, but this guy, Hugh Thomas, was the doctor for um, Rudolf Hess, one of the Nazis that was given a life sentence at Nuremberg, but you can see from his picture that he looks kind of goofy, and uh, it was a doppelganger, you know, a double that uh, went to, to uh, Nuremberg. He was... That he was trying to, um, they, they, nobody really knows what happened to Hess, you know. He was, but he never made it to Scotland. See, there's there's Hess. He's got a gas, gap between his teeth, and then there's the guy who ended up in Scotland. And you can see, you know, the, the, you know, the, and then then over here, you see that's Goring there, and they're in the docket, and he's kind of laughing at Hess. Uh, or he doesn't want him to hear. He's talking to this guy over here, but uh, and then something about the markings on the plane don't show up. So you know this is something that that it's a conspiracy, you know. And I don't believe everything I read. You know, I don't believe these chemtrails. I mean, if they wanted to poison us, they could do it. You know, that, that, that's just most of it is just vapor. And then a lot of times it's uh, an airplane getting rid of fuel. You know, they have to lighten the load to land, you know, or you're going to break the wings off or something. So another good book is this um, USS Liberty, you know, that was a, like, you know, after they killed Kennedy, Johnson got in there. And Johnson was a big friend of Israel. And I also think that, um, that, that you know, Kennedy was against nuclear pro proliferation, and so he would have been adamant that Israel wouldn't be allowed to develop nuclear weapons. So there was a lot of reasons to want to kill Kennedy, and uh, like he w like with his brother as Attorney General, they uh, went after uh, U.S. Steel and they uh, cracked down on um, you know like white collar crime and stuff like that. And so um, there were a lot of reasons, you know. And then after um, you know his brother was dead, Robert Kennedy was. Um, you know, he was aware, you know, he was the attorney general, so he knew that, you know, they, they got rid of his brother, and so they um, ended up uh, having to get Robert Kennedy. And I didn't bring the other book with me. It was called Brothers. It was by this guy named Talbot, and he um, he mentions E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturge. That's how I always know a good book about the Kennedy assassination, because they... Uh, mention Hunt and Sturgis, who were the two tramps. Well, among there were three tramps, and they were arrested behind the grassy knoll right after getting into a, a gondola car. And uh, so, I mean, it was kind of a big coincidence that they were there, and they looked just alike. You see, there's the tramp, and there's the tramp Sturgis. Oh, no, there he is. And yeah, Anyway, so... You know, it's like, you know, we've had a coup d'etat, and then, you know, this World Trade Center Building 7 comes down, and uh, on the same day, like later in the afternoon, and I don't know, if, I don't think a lot of people know that, you know, they're, but I didn't believe it. When I first heard that these buildings came straight down and nothing was left, I thought, what, you know, there's something physically wrong there, you know, there was no piles of glass, there was no concrete everywhere. And some of these cars, 
that were parked, you know, a couple blocks away were just like incinerated. There must have been some kind of a huge pyro. Well, you can see the pyroclastic cloud from, you know, everything turned to dust. It was all pulverized. All that asbestos and everything else that was in there. And, you know, it would have cost a whole lot of money to tear that building down and get all that asbestos out of there. So they conveniently destroyed it. And a lot of these guys that were cleaning it up ended up with uh, a lot of bad diseases, you know. And if it, there's asbestos there, I think it's, I don't know, 15 year latent time. And so let's see, 2001, well, they're going to start getting it now, maybe. I don't know. But I know that there's been a lot of studies of the, in fact, there's a Wikipedia article about uh, health complications from World War, or from the World Trade Center um, explosion. And uh, so, I mean, you know, it's just like there's never been a high rise building that collapsed, you know, just, uh, well, they, you know, Building 7 was, there, you know, no airplane crashed into that. And it was called World Trade Center Building 7. And you can see here that it just, uh, oops, i got to focus this, remove all this stuff here, and then put that back. And uh, it just comes straight down, you know, like controlled demolition. But, you know, there's so many anomalies, like in the Pentagon, that, um, you know, there, there's no, you don't see any, well, the jet engines, you know, they, did they just go right through the window? I mean, I didn't, I didn't see any windows that, a jet engine went through, you know, and so what probably crashed into the Pentagon was like a cruise missile or or some other kind of drone, you know, and and then they uh, planted all these other things inside, you know, uh, because they were doing construction around there, so they easily could have planted that, and so this these World Trade Center explosions and all this other stuff. Shanksville is a big big lie, you know. They there were no suitcases and and bodies or jet engines there either. You know, it was just like a smoking pit that some bulldozer dug up. You know, if you just do the slightest bit of research on this 9/11 thing, you know, there's a lot of good movies out there. Like um, what is that? Loose Change. You know, I've and uh, so that um, you know, it's just like unbelievable you know like when i first found out that the cia killed john kennedy it kind of like like stunned me it was, and uh so you know i've been like stunned so many times it's almost like i'm like i've been winded you know and uh it's hard to you know people think you're crazy and you're a conspiracy theorist you know and you know it's like uh, adolf hitler wrote in uh, mein kampf that that the broad masses more readily believe a big lie than a small lie because they would be ashamed to tell a big lie. And so, um, and then even when the facts are brought clearly before them, they will continue to doubt and waver, thinking there must be some other explanation. So, you know, he was, he knew what propaganda was, and so do um, the United States. You know, they had a guy named like Beans or something like that, and he came in with this fluoride thing and all this other stuff, you know, I think fluoride is a chemical that it's like lithium, you know, and lithium can control manic depressive people. And, you know, if you eat too much iron, it's going to make you lethargic and stuff like that. And so, you know, if you eat too much arsenic, you're going to die. If you eat too much mercury or any of these other things. And fluoride is too, you know, fluoride's a rat poison. So they put a little bit in there and apparently it does good for your teeth. You know, i grew up in uh, one of the cities that first started it and um, you know my teeth are really good for my age you know I try to keep my age a secret and um, so anyway there's um, a lot of lies going on and uh, you know like it here's the well like it's just you know it's been and the signs of the times is what's really important is you know, I mean, okay, but what can you do? You know, I mean, it's like, what, what, I mean, you know, like, it's kind, it's kind of, um, you know, it's, I mean, if people could wake up, I just don't think they will, you know, it's, it's too late, really, I think, and, uh, but, you know, we could make this a better place, and one way to do that would be, 
you know, if a lot of people just got together and said, hey, you know, look, you know, w we might end up extinct, you know, and, uh, you know, we can at least give it a try. You know, we, we stop going to these bogus jobs like that aren't creating or producing anything necessary, you know, and, uh, and you know, we don't need these cars and, uh, you know, commuting and all this stuff. And uh, so, you know, it's just crazy madness, you know, and pollution. And, and it's all because of money, you know, there's a profit on it. And you've got all these unnecessary jobs like bankers, bookkeepers, accountants, salesmen, sales clerks. You know, we can start making our own clothes and building really nice cities, you know, with parks everywhere and swimming pools everywhere and healthy food instead of this greasy poison and everything, you know, and and get rid of all these noisy cars and and just, you know, get back to nature. But, you know, I think that the elite people don't want this to happen. You know, like I said, they've got their jets and yachts and, and 100,000 acre lot, um, ranches and things like that they can, they can go to. And so, you know, like the Scientologists, that guy uh, has that 747, uh, what's his name, uh, was in that movie Grease, I think. So anyway, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess, like I said, um, you can just be aware of things and, you know, if... Um, if you ever find out that I'm telling the truth I know about these things, you know, the Kennedy assassination and this Holocaust and, uh, and you know, uh, World Trade Center, um, the USS Liberty. You know, John McCain's dad was on, um, involved in the cover-up. And like I was saying, you know, Johnson started getting involved in Vietnam and, and he also was a big friend of Israel, and so um, Johnson uh, set up this USS Liberty to, to go off the coast of Israel during the Six-Day War. And then uh, Israel sent some jets out there, and they obviously knew that this was the USS Liberty. I mean, you can't disguise a, a ship like that. It, was a, it had all kinds of antennas on it, it was painted navy gray, it had the big letters on there and the flag flying. And so it was a deliberate attempt to sink the USS Liberty. They had heat-seeking missiles take out the radio antennas. You know, the radio antennas create a lot of heat. And so, um, but one of the antennas was shut off because they were doing maintenance on it. And so after the, they sent torpedo boats to torpedo it, you know, and they weren't that far away. And the soldiers on the deck said they, the Israeli army flew so close to them that they could wave to the pilot, you know. So they deliberately tried to sink it, and then John McCain's dad and a bunch of other high-up Navy people covered up this USS Liberty thing and made it sound like Israel mistaked this um, st strategic, unusual Navy ship for an old, uh, like, horse carrier, you know? I mean, it's totally ridiculous, but, you know, who has the time to go and do this kind of research. Well, I did, you know, I didn't really ever have a job. I made money through tax liens and I've given a lot of money to this state and to this county, you know, I just wrote off like $6,000 in bad liens I bought, you know. I thought that this property would increase in value because, you know, <laughs> the stupid housing market, you know, the bubble and all that funny money stuff that Al, Alan Greenspan, you know, and, and the, you know, if I could have sold everything back then, I'd have been a millionaire, but I didn't listen to my sister. My sister warned me, you know, that, but I thought that, you know, Arizona being down here with a limited amount of land, you could uh, get, um, you know, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't affect us here. So anyway, my name is Raquel. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. It's one of the words they don't translate correctly. And obviously, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. You know, it's like he didn't walk on water. That's a metaphor. And he might not even have existed. You know, I don't think he existed. And, you know, if, if you know, it's people believe this crazy stuff. And the Muslims are much worse. You know, the Muslims believe they're right and they're they're killing Christians and you know they this never was a problem until recently but anyway 
God bless. Peace and love. I'll see you back here in about two months. Have a nice spring. Bye.